Bang, and we are back. Our next panel will discuss the consequences, advantages, challenges, and general outlook of the whole crypto industry after the COVID-19 outbreak. Where, oh, where will things go from this time in history? Trying to answer these questions are our panelists. Um, our first panelist is head of business development at Dash. Welcome, Ernesto Contravaz. Next, we have founder and chairman of Saga, Ido Sida Man. Third on the panel, he is the head of securities. Uh, he was the head of securities at Swift and now the C CEO of OnChain Custodian. We have Alexander Keck uh, on the panel. Next, we have the founder and CEO of Stasis.net, Gregor Gregory. Uh, Klumov, and our moderator for this one is the talented and award-winning blockchain journalist. Please welcome Kai Sedwick and this amazing panel. Kai, the panel is all yours. Take it away. Thank you. Well, I don't know how to follow an introduction like that. Um, so very happy to have you guys all with us today to talk about stable coins and stability in what has been so far an extremely unstable year. So we're gonna have a little chat about stable coins as they affect the crypto economy, but also as it plays into some of the wider global trends that we're seeing, uh, including crypto dollarization, the potential release of digital dollars and central bank digital currencies. And we're also gonna get a bit deeper and think about just how stable is the dollar and these other fiat assets that stable coins are pegged to. So perhaps if everyone could just briefly, um, if you'd all just tell us a little bit about your your background and your your sort of expertise as it as it plays into to our topic today. Um, Ido, could you could you start? Yeah. Hi Kai, uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I'm the founder of Saga. I founded it uh, two and a half years ago in the attempt of creating a global currency that is not dependent of any single. Uh, uh, nation state and their fiscal and monetary agenda under the premise that a global economy, as, as COVID-19 is proving, um, indeed needs a, a global currency as a store of value and as a medium of exchange. Uh, when doing so, well, we've, we understood several things. The first one is that stability needs to be maintained throughout the process, um, or relative stability, and we'll, we'll discuss what is stable uh, in a sec. Uh, but secondly, that independence need to be uh, acquired gradually as trust is acquired. And this is how we built uh, the, the monetary and governance models uh, of Saga to maintain stability and to acquire independence uh, gradually while maintaining the, the holders of the currency, the sole sovereigns, um, the sole sovereigns of it. Thank you. And Alexander, briefly. Sure. So uh, I used to work in the traditional banking and capital market industry, first at Bank of New York Mellon and then at SWIFT. Uh, so SWIFT is the uh, interbank payment mechanism that today is used to transfer fiat currencies between banks uh, for the benefits of um, corporates and, 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 and individuals as well. And I moved recently, uh, let's meaning a year and a half, to the digital asset space to uh, create with the Hong Fei, the founder of NEO, uh, the uh, custody business in Singapore. So what we do is servicing our customers in the sense of safekeeping their assets. That includes stable coins like USDT, USDC, and others, but also traditional cryptocurrencies and also um, uh, gold back tokens, for example. And as, as we talk about stability, maybe gold back tokens are the stable coins of the future. Who, who knows? And uh, so today I will try to contribute with my past 22 years experience in the banking and capital market space and uh, marry it in a way with uh, what I'm observing today. Perfect. Ernesto. Yeah. Hi, guys. It's a pleasure being with you. Um, my name is Ernesto Contreras. I, I'm the head of business development for Dashcore Group. Basically, what I do is I help Dash grow 
and we've identified two segments where uh, cryptocurrency and Dash in particular can provide some growth. That is on the cross-border segments and on the unstable markets. So we've had a, quite a bit of share of understanding of what people consider stable and unstable and how people are willing to use cryptocurrency and Dash in particular. I have about 16 years of experience growing uh, consumer products and technology. I've uh, been with Dash for about two and something years. And before Dash, I was a director of uh, marketing for a cryptocurrency exchange. So it's really interesting to see how users perceive that this thing called crypto can help them from different ways. Perfect. And finally, Gregory. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Gregory Klumov and I'm founder of Stasis. Um, I studied computer science and started my first company when I was 15 years old. It was internet service provider. And then I went into finance and uh, did hedge funds, research, institutional asset management. Um, and I studied a lot of things about monetary systems, uh, capitalism, uh, free markets. And during the global financial crisis, I was so obsessed with the central banks uh, and their actions. So I was starting uh, to search for an asset that could benefit um, uh, or could provide exposure to an alternative um, monetary system. Uh, and Bitcoin naturally caught my eye. And my partner and I, we created the world's first Bitcoin fund. And when we started trading it, it became clear that there should be something of a stable value, uh, at least um, in uh, institutional minds perspective, that you can transfer between exchanges, you can go into sort of digital cash during the times of volatility. Um, and uh, three years ago, uh, I created a concept which is now live and we are the biggest X dollar stable coin on the market. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna tackle stable coins from a few different angles, um, but just to just to zoom out a little bit, and everything we're discussing today is of course against the backdrop of the, the economic events of this year, which were triggered by by COVID nineteen. Um, then we'd like to, to to give their thoughts on how the, the use and value of stable coins has changed since the, this pandemic started. So obviously. You know, there's been a lot of talk about you know, what does what do these global events and the, the sort of quantitative easing and the money printing what does this mean for for Bitcoin? But in terms of stable coins, we've seen we've seen on chain um, volumes soar since the middle of March. And there's been a lot of volatility. We've seen the overall stable coin market cap soar as well. So it seems that you know, based on what's happened so far this year, that you know, 2020 is going to be a a very good year for stable coins. Um, would anyone like to comment on where, where you see this trend going uh, and how this is gonna play out in the context of, of these broader global events that have been triggered by COVID-19? Well, I can start if you want. So, well, I think the surge of using of stable coins is not necessarily linked to the need for in, of individuals needing to transfer money across uh, border or retail players uh, having a need for a payment mechanism uh, in absence of a defaulting existing one. I think it's more um, crypto players having a need to hedge their risks um, with the volatility of Bitcoin that we have seen in the last month uh, at the same time as the crisis kicks. Uh, and, and I don't think, and as we discussed in our preparatory call, the, the challenge with stable coins today is that it's pegged with US dollar. Uh, most of them at least, except maybe the one uh, of Craig. Um, and, and, and that's a challenge because uh, if the fiat currency crashes, if uh, something goes wrong with um, the printing of money you were referring to and the bubble effectively burst and uh, the printing of money doesn't work anymore, stable coins will disappear at the same time that US dollar will disappear. So uh, I think it's interesting to look at alternative to stable coins, or at least stable coins pegged by something else than US dollar. Uh, that's maybe something we can discuss with my uh, co-panelists on, on what could be that alternative. I mentioned gold, why not? Uh, something else could be a solution, but uh, uh, stable coins will definitely be, um, I, I will definitely have to evolve away from traditional banking and traditional capital market if it's 
if it wants to, to be sust sustainable and stable uh, over time. Yeah, I think perhaps uh, you don't maybe should bring you in at this stage as you probably have some thoughts on on stable coins that can be be backed by by more than just just USD. Um, certainly from your experience with Sega. Yeah. Is there anything you like to add there? Yeah. Uh, so first of all, I, I definitely agree with uh, Alexander. Uh, the soaring market cap uh, increase of stable coins is mostly people within uh, the crypto industry. I think possibly with one exception, which is uh, not yet showing in volume, which is in countries such as those that Ernesto spoke about, whether it's Argentina, Venezuela, Brazil, Turkey, South Africa, where um, it's uh, it's it's. Uh, uh, funny, but uh, they are actually more experienced with instability than uh, than the web, the, the developed world. Uh, but I think that we have to carry our eyes to them because they are used to finding stability in unstable uh, environments. And it seems that we will start. Uh, we would need to start uh, getting used to it as well. Um, so uh, definitely, a stable coin is just as stable as its underlying asset. Uh, and what we're witnessing in the past few weeks is that uh, if this underlying asset is uh, the dollar or the euro or the RMB, um, it's not as stable as we would like uh, to think it is, especially not when uh, um, the Federal Reserve and the ECB are announcing uh, tremendous amounts of money printing, um, that the result of which we'll uh, have to discover later. Uh, we at Saga chose from the very start to base uh, our currency on the SDR, which is a basket of currencies in use uh, uh, since 1969, issued by the IMF, the composition of which is issued by the IMF. And they, this is how central banks are actually keeping their reserve currently. Um, up until now, it has taken a toll, an educational toll, right? Because no one uses the SDR. The, the value is around $1.40. Um, it's not a medium of exchange, uh, but now we're st starting to see people interested in it because it provides inherent stability by diversification. Uh, and I think that diversification is a key word for, for stability. When one uh, asset will go up, uh, another one will go down. Thanks. And Ernesto, just to bring you in, um, I know you're in South America just now, um, I believe you're in Venezuela. And I'm sure you've got some some first-hand and anecdotal experience of the instability of of national fiat currencies, and perhaps you could provide some comment on on how cryptocurrency is perceived in in Venezuela and in South America um, compared to to you know stable coins or to to fiat currencies, which which have their own um, well-documented problems with with inflation. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, just like Ida was saying, um, what I've seen and what we've seen in Dash, because we've been targeting the Venezuelan usage for some time, because we saw that people in broken economies see cryptocurrency as another option. Just like Ida was saying, you know, stable means that you have different options and they behave differently. Therefore, your full portfolio doesn't go down because the dollar went down or because gold went down. So what I'm seeing in the past few weeks is reminiscent of what we've seen South Americans with the Argentinian crisis, with the Mexican crisis, and with the Venezuelan crisis, because when things started to you know, behave weirdly, Venezuelans went and bought a bunch of toilet paper or bought a bunch of dollars or bought a bunch of other things. So this has been interesting to see that crisis know no borders and stability has been redefined. So that's why so far I've seen the crypto markets behave good because it's no longer only for speculation. Let's say you're in a market and you're concerned with all the printing of money. Well, now you can put some of that money in crypto and it doesn't, uh, it, it, in theory, it will not go the same path as the economy of the country that is printing a lot of dollars or believers. In Venezuela, we've seen it. Like every month we print lots and lots of believers to the point that they're now literally worthless on the streets, some of the older bills. 
And having other options provide stability on times of such uncertainty. OK, thank you. Um, and yeah, I mean, what you're saying there about, about money printing, obviously, you know, we're all aware that, you know, the, the biggest meme of 2020, it's all about money printing. And I think it's fair to say that the, the fiscal stimulus we've seen in all countries, you know, probably starting in the US, um, but it's really been, you know, throughout the world. It's, it's kind of red pilling people a lot on, on the extent of, of the rampant money printing that's been, you know, been going on for, for decades. And uh, Greg, perhaps you've got something uh, you might wish to add at this juncture. Yeah, mm, uh, let's, let's think of a stable coin term because nobody really coined it. And it is something that journalists came on six, four years ago uh, when they climbed their learning curve of understanding what digital assets are and what Bitcoin is. So there is stable is definitely discussable. What, what is really stable? But what I can tell you from the capital market perspective is that every new emerging market was started, its assets started to be priced in dollars first. So uh, it doesn't matter, Brazil, China, Russia, you name it, Thailand, every emerging market started pricing its assets, equities, bonds in dollars. And later on, the market evolved, local market uh, got more and more asset managers, and then suddenly uh, currencies changed. So crypto is a relatively new market, it's just 10 years old. Uh, Time will pass in in next few years. There'll be original uh, diversification. There'll be more uh, natural currencies trading digital assets, and the dollar uh, will slowly wear off as the main, say, asset of stability for the crypto world. Because when the first stable coins started to show up, uh, the volatility in Bitcoin was in triple digits. So anything that is better than that uh, was considered stable. So if we, I mean, there's a lot of people who believe that the you know, the dollar is going to be, let's say, replaced, but that the, the era of the dollar's hegemony has, has, um, is coming to an end. So the question is, what do you see replacing it? So right now, for example, you know, as we've established, most stable coins are, they're dollar pegged, or they're, they're meant to be. Do we see another, another nation's currency coming to dominate, or are we going to see um, some sort of basket of currencies or some sort of global digital currency that will become the, the internationally accepted um, unit of value? Well, I still think it should come from the reporting currency for, pe for people. There is a big society in Europe for 100 million people who have income in euros, who pay taxes in euros, who know how much a, a price of coffee costs in euros, how much their rent costs, how much their car costs. So this is this comes from the perception. In Venezuela, people uh, are rushing to buy goods just because they don't know what their currency is worth. So they measure uh, stuff they measure life and, and, and their necessities in goods. It, it happens in every hyperinflationary country. But when you've got a period of low inflation, say 20, 30, 40 years, people uh, are uh, getting used to that national currency and they measure everything in it. So I, th I definitely see this next step of development of a stable coins globally in backing uh, with traditional fiat currencies like dollars, euros, yen, British pounds. The major Major G4, G7 currencies. I think perhaps you know this brings us on to Libra, which is back in the news again this week. Now, as everyone knows, Libra started out as a very ambitious project. You know, regardless of any you know misgivings people from crypto may have about it, it was a extremely bold project based on what other you know payment processors and, and tech companies were doing at the time. And now we've seen that it's going to go. It's going to go ahead as a very, as a very watered down version of its initial, as its initial plan, and it's basically a series of, of stable coins. Um, perhaps Alexander, to go back to you, you could perhaps give your, your your thoughts on on Libra as we now as we now see it today, or as it's been uh, revealed this week. Sure. So, um, well, I agree with Greg that I mean. Uh, national currencies, better, whether it's uh, digitized on blockchain or not, uh, will be uh, will remain a very important uh, reference for individuals like you and me because that's what we're used to, and it's 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 easier. And, and, and most people don't want to start thinking about 
uh, what is what is important for them in terms of value. So I think all the initiatives that we see from the China, the, the PBOC in China or other, other other central banks looking at having a direct access to investors issuing uh, um, central bank uh, coins, uh, I think it, it is is worth looking at, and I think will uh, will pre will be very important in the future. I think it will be in combination with commercial initiatives like the Libra uh, initiative. Uh, and uh, JP Morgan coins is another example of, of, of uh, commercial initiatives, or um, like, um, and, and I think I don't think one will prevail. It will be a mix of multiple uh, issues of digital assets that people will uh, hold and use based on their needs, based on the moments of history they are in, whether it's a crisis or whether it's not a crisis. Uh, whether they are banked or unbanked, for example, and uh, uh, Libra uh, is aimed at unbanked, at least part of the usage of Libra will likely be by unbanked. Uh, for example, uh, I, I like the, uh, the, the the region where I live, Asia, uh, in Vietnam, for example, uh, when uh, you buy a mobile phone, you get free internet access to one application, which, which is called Facebook. And for many people in Vietnam with uh, using some providers, internet is Facebook. So imagine that for them, if they're able to only not only talk to their friends, but also pay with Facebook uh, through a Libra uh, app uh, that is linked to the Facebook application they have, it's important for them because they don't have bank accounts, etc. So what I, I think we will see in terms of stable coins or, or, or coins that are linked to uh, backed by assets, you will have a combination of uh, central bank issued coins, commercially issued coins. Similar to the, in the past, you had uh, notes that were printed by central banks and by commercial banks and by uh, other, other means. If you go to Hong Kong, for example, you still have a lot of uh, notes that are printed by HSBC, for example, or, or others. It's, it's just the way it is. It will be a mix of multiple um, uh, stable coins, as you want to call it, Issued by the commercial uh, for commercial reasons or for private uh, by a private entity and by a central bank that will coexist and hopefully will be interoperable and exchangeable with one another in a smooth way uh, to enable people to switch from one another depending on the situation. I so I fully agree with uh, um, I, I fully agree with Alex. I, I, I think that diversity is uh, is key to stability. Diversification is key to the ability of being resilient, uh, whether by switching between assets or by combining the holdings of several assets. Um, that's that that's almost a physical proof, right? Uh, not only a monetary one. As to Libra, I think that when you note know the changes in in the white paper, then they are on three fronts. The first one is monetary. Uh, they withdrew their own basket of currencies in favor of. Uh, existing uh, pegging to existing currencies or the SDR uh, for for the LBR currency, uh, and, and I think that's a very good thing. Uh, the second thing is around compliance, uh, FATF guidelines, anti anti money laundering, etc. But the third one, which I think remains problematic and and uh, uh, is ever the, the problem of which is ever more evident, uh, is the governance side. So on this side, um, Facebook remains on a permission uh, blockchain uh, controlled by the association, which is an association of commercial companies. And I think that here it's important to ask the question uh, of who holds the keys to the printing machine. Um, and, and that's the same printing machine that we have with central banks, uh, where the independence means that they're not accountable enough to the currency holder. I think that with a corporate structure, it is even more evident. Uh, and so uh, I would call Facebook to, to uh, step the extra mile, uh, move towards a permissionless, a permissionless blockchain, or uh, uh, alternatively, step away from blockchain, which as a technology doesn't make sense as long as uh, decentralization is, is not a part of things. So just, just building on what you're, what you're saying there, Ido, and um, perhaps Ernesto, I can, I can bring you in here. Do you feel, on, and does anyone else in this conversation feel that the events of this year, you know, COVID-19 and everything that's happened, have they expedited the move to, to central bank digital currencies or to digital dollars? Or, you know, 
was this was this happening anyway, or do we feel that the, the timeline has sped up at all since the, the events that, that started earlier this year, um, Ernesto? Yeah, well, um, what, what we've seen around the world is that um, people were forced to go digital. So if you had a small restaurant in Mexico City and you were not doing delivery, you're either shut down right now or you found a way to you know make some kind of delivery so you can pay some of your expenses within that push to digital comes the payment uh, possibilities and within payments there are some opportunities where people might consider crypto for example in places where there's a lot of migrants or where there's a lot of poverty it makes sense for me to you know pay the 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 basket of goods or the supermarket bill to my family back home so they can you know eat so that is some of the possibilities that are being opened up to these cross border solutions and and what i what we the, the ceo of dash core uh, tweeted a few months ago that libra was not going to get off the ground because of this huge uh, number of corporations with uh, crossing objectives like it's going to be very hard to get uh, you know, at that moment, Visa, MasterCard, Stripe, and and PayPal on the same page. So, um, if they can, you know, go beyond that, and and some of the those members have already left Libra. So, whenever they go down to their to their watered down uh, set of constituents and they launch, I think Libra will be a, a good uh, PayPal 2.0, meaning it's going to have some good features. Facebook is very good at making good UX, but it's still going to be difficult for some people to use it. I just spoke to somebody here in Venezuela last night. She bought $20 on PayPal. They, she got paid and they were blocked immediately for some reason she can't understand. So um, probably if it happens, it's going to be good. Facebook has a lot of, of, of a huge reach, but um, there will still be some of these almost 2 billion people that are now unbanked that will not be able to reach Libra because of regulatory or whatever reason. So that still poses a huge opportunity for those in crypto that can do it well and that can show uh, provide value to these people with a decentralized, non-government uh, non managed or, or manipulated type of currency. And uh, Gregory, just to switch over to you now, and and building upon what Ernesto was saying there, do you think that you know currencies, digital currencies like Libra and some of these other digital currencies, uh, Gregory, do you think they're actually they're really going to help to you know bank the unbanked, or are we going to actually see the opposite happen and perhaps you know greater inequality um, develop between those who can you know provide the, the documentation and the verification they need and those who simply can't get into this digital system and will, will remain excluded? Well, I'm a libertarian and I really love markets to regulate uh, supply and demand on their own. And I totally hate when somebody with a central authority uh, comes in and messes with that. So I totally believe technology, decentralized technology like blockchain can help uh, bank them bank. In fact, you can download Stasis wallet or any stable coin wallet or any non-custodial wallet right now and get access to something of stable value in a, in a traditional terms relative to the basket of goods over a long period of time. So you can download an Ethereum enabled wallet and access those stable coins that, that have a value of a dollar or a euro or something else. I was a pretty uh, loud critic of Libra, Libra and I was pretty vocal about it. I wrote a couple articles and I agree with Ernesto, it's really hard to put corporations uh, to negotiate on the terms, but it's more, it's even more harder and I would say impossible to, uh, uh, to mix monetary policies. And everybody who studied macroeconomics understands that different central banks might have different policies, different priorities, and the European Central Bank has a totally different uh, priority relative to the US Central Bank. US Central Bank targets uh, employment, while European Central Bank targets uh, stability. This, these are two, the, the, they may sound like to, to a listener as not a big deal, but believe me, in capital markets, it's a significant deal. And there was an example when in 2008, 
ex-ECB president raised interest rates right before the crisis, just because there was instability on the markets and the inflation was going up while the US Central Bank was lowering interest rates. So you cannot mix the products of these uh, institutions into one uh, basket and sell it as a product. It, it just won't work. There is mixing conflicting interests. But at the same time, uh, decentralized blockchain, proof of work blockchain offers incredible uh, technology which can quantify trust to a network. Suddenly, we don't need to quantify trust to a counterparty, to a balance sheet or to some insurance uh, that is levied upon bank accounts, but we can quantify trust to a network and measure exactly how much of our capital, our resources, we can trust that particular network. And that's, I think, the, the most powerful component of what this technology offers today. And when we think about some of the other things that blockchains are good for, or you know, public blockchains, um, or rather if you think of some of the things they're not good for, we take Bitcoin as an example. Um, it's a brilliant pseudonymous cryptocurrency, but it's not great for privacy, as, as we now will know. And so looking looking at stable coins and uh, you know you mentioned earlier that you know maybe some of these things, some of these stable coins don't even need a blockchain since we're entering a world where you know everything's going digital our money included and, and cash is basically basically dead and um alexander maybe bring you in here could you maybe maybe give us your thoughts on some of the privacy issues we, we could potentially face in a world where you know all our money is is on chain and it's very easy for governments and other entities to meet our who's got cash, what they're doing with it, and, and who they're sending it to? Well, it's a complicated question, to be honest. And it's a, it's it's not something that uh, I would dare say I have an answer to in the sense that um, what is privacy? I mean, privacy is often understood more based on the feeling of the individual wanting or not wanting to keep its privacy intact. When you see how easy it is for my teenagers, kids to give everything on internet to uh, to uh, Facebook and, and Instagram without even thinking about the concept of privacy, and I need to educate them about the, about it. And, and it's not only about kids; it's also about uh, uh, adults, young adults, and older adults who don't understand how to keep their privacy intact in the, on those type of platforms. Uh, I think privacy is very important for people who absolutely want to uh, philosophically keep their privacy intact. It is probably not a concern for a vast majority of people who are just living their life. And it's a major issue for people who are scamming and uh, who are criminals. So on each side of the spectrum, you will have, uh, we, we need to find solutions to uh, the right balance to ensure that, for example, I don't want as a company to facilitate money laundering or financial terrorism. So I'm absolutely in favor of AML, KYC, and CFT uh, um, regulations and 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 and, uh, and, and um, I, processes that I have to put in place to ensure that I'm not facilitating those type of criminal activities. At the same time, I understand that some of my customers don't want me to report everything to the regulators on what they do because it's their own investment. Um, although everything would be visible on the blockchain if, if it's Bitcoin. Uh, so I don't have an answer to, the, to your question. I think it's going to be a very complicated balance to strike in this world that we're building where everything is visible on blockchain. And it's just a question of being able to allocate address to individuals or address to corporates to know who's doing what. Uh, I would be very interested to understand what our, my colleagues or panelists are, our views are on this, front, on this point. Yeah, perhaps uh, Ido, do you have anything to add there on the, the privacy trade-offs that, that this entails? I, I, uh, first, to agree with uh, Alexander that uh, I, I, uh, I don't have an, an answer either. Uh, I think it's a complicated uh, it's a complicated issue, and although I agree that um, um, most people um, don't care of privacy as much as we uh, would think, uh, I think that another issue is the issue of data management and data manipulation. And here, I think that we're starting to care. Um, the, the entire concept of truth whether it's the truth of the market in, in terms of price discovery 
or whether it's the, the, the truth of what we hear on the news on COVID-19, uh, is making usage of, of uh, data that is manipulated. And I think that this is uh, a, a quite a worrisome issue. Um, and, and, and Facebook is, is a part of it. Uh, and so I, I just ran across a meme yesterday saying, uh, Facebook, you don't have anything to hide. Uh, Libra, you don't have uh, anywhere to hide. Uh, so uh, it, it, it is an issue, the balance of uh, how much can data be used uh, to help uh, uh, provide a better service, whether from a government or a corporate, and how much and, and what is the balance with privacy uh, is ever more present. Here in, in Tel Aviv, from where I'm speaking, just a month ago, the government took a decision of being able to use uh, uh, security-oriented um, uh, technology that tracks uh, location of uh, phones uh, to help uh, um, um, lighten the quarantine effect by being able to target uh, specific uh, uh, specific locations um, and warn specific people, and and the controversy is um, is quite alarming. Yeah, I think uh, privacy is a rabbit hole. We could go pretty far down if we had more time. And you know, I'm not a big fan of KYC ML, but you know, again, <laughs> we 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 could de we could debate that for hours if we're able to. But since we are um, getting towards the end of this panel, uh, just to, just to circle back to the start and to to discuss you know stability in the context of the events of this year and where we go from here, perhaps we could wrap things up by everyone you know briefly giving their thoughts on some of the trends that they think will will play out for the rest of this year. So I'm not interested in your Bitcoin price predictions or your your halvening predictions, but let's just talk about some of the broad trends we can expect to see. Um, primarily within the crypto sphere, but also within the, the broader economy for, for the remainder of 2020. Um, perhaps Gregory, you'd like to start? Um, sure. So I, I personally truly believe that M1 component of the money supply is the one that should be targeted by the stablecoin uh, issuers. It's all cash. So the right M1, M2, M3 money components. And M1 is usually 10 times smaller than M2. For example, there is uh, around uh, 12 trillion euros outstanding, but only around 1 trillion in cash. And we've been winning every single conversation we had with regulators globally that stablecoins is like cash, but better. When somebody transacts with a the cash, there is literally no trail. Uh, it's impossible to track it down. Also, the counterfeiting of cash is a huge, significant issue for uh for all the central banks globally 100 dollar note is the single most counterfeited currency in the world also it's the single best currency to buy drugs weapons and all things of illicit trade so stable coins can really help uh, uh clean uh, uh, the transactions and clean the markets out of illicit usage uh, when cash now has a totally different concept after the pandemic where everybody doesn't want to touch things and stuff that other people touched. So in that sense, uh, digital assets and stable points could be a perfect uh, solution to that. Yeah, I think we'll probably reach the stage where when anyone refers to cash in the future, they will mean digital cash because there will be no physical cash. You know, you can't, you can't even pay for a pizza anymore with cash, you know. Um, Ernesto, very, very quickly, give us um, 30 seconds and some of your predictions for the rest of this year in terms of the crypto markets. Yeah, sure. Well, I think that just like the war, the world war, and then the banking crisis in 20, 2008 marked a lot of people, this COVID crisis is going to leave a big mark on everyone. And it's just disrupted what we thought was stable. So within this disruption, there are a lot of very clear trends. Everything is going digital. Before, you know, we used to go to Instagram or TikTok to have some fun. But now the rest of the components of your life has been digitalized. You know, conferences like this will happen more and more. Um, tools to work uh, from home are going to be more normal. And money has been becoming more digital. So this is opening up the opportunities. People are now seeing that this thing called cryptocurrency is real and I can send you money to Tel Aviv and you can send it back to the US and it works and you can cash it out. So this is an eye-opening moment 
for a lot of the people in the world right now. And uh, this just is, is proof that we are in an industry that will continue providing solutions for more uh, of the problems that are now more evident for everyone. And we can just, you know, help people and helping people will help the industry grow. Perfect. Well, listen, it was a pleasure chatting to you all. I think we're out of time now, but um, really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Thank you, it was good. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Right. My pleasure. Sure. Bye. Guys, thank you very much for that. That was incredibly valuable information and a great panel. Um, thank you very much, Ernesto, Alexander, Gregory, Kai, and Ido. Ido's going to come right back after a short little break, and we're going to do uh, a 20 minute AMA with our global community here at Blockdown 2020. So stay tuned uh, as the party continues with Ido right after this break. <laughs>